Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger and Rachel Wojtek. And as promised, we are discussing Egypt today. We're going to start off with the chronology of ancient Egypt because we realize there's there's no way to proceed until we've addressed this snafu in the... <laughs> <laughs> That's Good a word. nice way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, w- wherein consists the snafu? Would you please inform us, Greg? <laughs> well, let me read a verse from the book of Kings. This is chapter 6, verse 1. It came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of the month, I'm sorry, the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month Ziph, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. The um, the date here is given as a, a, a relative date for the construction of the temple, 480 years after the Exodus. Well, we know more or less when Solomon built his temple. There's general agreement on that. It's the date still may be a little shaky and a little off, but not by tremendous amounts. And when we count back 480 years from there and say, all right, so the Exodus should be around here someplace. As we look at Egyptian records and what little histories we have of Egypt from other sources, there's no Exodus. Um it's uh, it, it it seems to be missing because well first of all we probably should talk a little bit about what the exodus looked like. The exodus involved the movement of some what is it six million no six hundred thousand footmen so around two million yeah. or more people mm-hmm. uh, who had been slave labor for Egypt out of the country. That in itself should kind of leave an impression historic. <laughs> yeah. Something um, must have changed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, think of our own civil war. Like, it'd be mm-hmm. strange if in a, a few hundred years people look back and said, what civil war? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's not likely. Uh, well, it also, even before the Exodus, there should be evidence that that many people were living in Egypt and they would look mm-hmm. distinct from the rest of the Egyptians, uh, archaeologically speaking. Yeah. So you've got that going on. And then we come to this whole matter of how God got his people out. It was not a slow trickling out family by family that the Egyptians kind of overlooked while a few puddles became blood and a few frogs <laughs> hopped across them. As God describes the, the plagues, they were dramatic, traumatic, and disastrous. By the time God was done, uh, the crops were gone, all of them, because it lasted through all of the harvest seasons. The cattle were gone, except those that Israel had inherited. People had suffered horrible diseases after being deprived of drinking water for a solid week. Uh, Their king was lost in the Exodus proper, and the heir of the throne and, uh, and one boy child in every single house had died the night before. The army was lost, together with all its chariots. Uh, this is not looking good for anybody. Oh, and the, the slaves, as they left, they uh, asked for payment for their years of service, and so they took all the treasures with them, too. That's not something, that, that's not a little hiccup in history that if you turn your head, you missed. Mm-hmm. This is something that would absolutely devastate Egypt and leave it in chaos and open to invasion. But when, following traditional his, histories and chronologies, we count back 480 years from the time that Solomon's temple was built. That's not the Egypt we find. In fact, we find Egypt in one of its highest periods. Uh, names like Thutmose III, who was one of the uh, foremost uh, exporters of conquest and war for Egypt, had Chetsup, the female emperor, who uh, raised Egypt to the heights of its economic power. The boy King Tut, Tutankhamun. Uh, th- these are names we know from the history books. Mm-hmm. And they were all powerful kings, or at least surrounded by powerful advisors, and nothing really bad happened. We know way too much about these time periods of these people. And oh, and remember, the 
Egyptian, the Pharaoh of the Exodus, died in the Red Sea, died in sunk. And the Egyptians were kind of busy. They probably didn't have time to go hunt for him underwater, pull him out, and mummify him. So we should expect that the, the, there would be no mummy for this king. Well, for the kings that actually reigned at that time, according to, to uh, traditional chronologies, we, we, we have the mummies. We know their names. We know their successes. We, we know all about them. This just plain wasn't it. And so we're left with a couple of possibilities. The one unfortunate, well, the one that humanists pick, obviously, is, well, the Bible's just wrong. We never expected it to be accurate in the first place, so no surprise. Among even evangelicals, you get a taste of this. Well, you know... Um, it's a symbolic 480 years. Yeah, there's it that. It just meant some time. That's what, I, mean, that's what I always say when I, <laughs> when I want to say some, some period of time. I always you know, tell you how many. When, you yeah. <laughs> um, so what's, what's very interesting here is I recently watched a video, which will probably be my recommendation at the end, and they were talking to Jewish scholars and rabbis, and mm -hmm. well, we can't find any proof for the Exodus. What does that do to your Jewish faith? How can you possibly carry on? And it's, they said something like, well, it's not about it being true. It's about it providing <laughs> meaning. And yes. that's what matters. <laughs> Even like, if it's fake meaning. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't, the truth of history doesn't matter in this context, just as long as it provides meaning to your mm. faith. Yeah. Which mm. is, you know, the that's exact thing that we are speaking against of, no, it, <laughs> it's history and meaning, truth and significance for faith. You don't need no. to separate the two. Yeah. For us, that would be saying, it doesn't matter if Jesus actually rose again. As mm -hmm. long as he's alive in your heart. Yes. Yeah. Exactly no. the same thing, just a slightly <laughs> different angle. Well, yes, and but for us as Christians, that Old Testament story is ours too. And mm -hmm. and this is something that evangelicals sometimes have a hard time with. Uh, they, they, they far too often are willing to give it away because, well, it's Old Testament. Mm -hmm. it's, it, we're talking about archaeology and pagan history. Does it really matter as long as we know that God rescues his people? Yes. Does he really? Because <laughs> yeah. I want to know if he yeah. really rescues his yeah. people. Did he, did he actually rescue them, or is it just uh, a story, a fairy tale, an upper story experience? I was uh, when we moved into the facility the school uses now, and I was setting up my classroom. I found that someone had left behind a a, a Bible. It's called the Life Application Study Bible. I'd never seen mm -hmm. it before. I just glanced at it, and I turned to Exodus, and this is what I found there: no evidence of this great Exodus has been discovered in Egyptian historical records. Apparently, there wasn't much else there. I would think I would have written it down. Uh, no attempt to explain why that should be, just an observation that um, we haven't found any reference to this in Egyptian history. You, you want to think, yeah, the, this life application Bible seemed like it was a Bible aimed at teenagers and college students. So you, you think you might want to take a guess at what's going on here, have a <laughs> hypothesis, Offer some explanation, or maybe just state the obvious that Egypt's historical records stink. <laughs> and yeah, like let's they're just not willing to admit. On, yeah, yeah. The the pagan world is not great at history in general. But let's take this this statement on its face value and ask: Is it true, myth or fact? Is there <laughs> has there been no evidence discovered of the Exodus? Well, where they're looking. No. So, you know, <laughs> if, if mom has scrawled a note to you and, and you don't read it very well and you just glance at something and you go out in the garage to get the thing the note says you should get and you look around and nothing seems to fit and nothing seems to make sense, it might occur to you that you're looking in the wrong place. <laughs> and just maybe the fault isn't with mom. Maybe you just read things wrong and are, are, are misinterpreting what she actually did in fact say. Uh, if, if we look at the historical records where we think we're supposed to be and what God says should be there isn't there, could it just be possible we're looking in the wrong place? How about if we look around and see if there is evidence someplace else in the historical record? And then if we find something, and even if we don't, we might, we might want to ask, how reliable is the chronology that holds this record together anyhow? And, and before we pursue this further, I think I'd like to talk about the nature of chronology. You know, mm -hmm. when people want to read the Bible and they hit the so-called 
boring parts. <laughs> what are we usually talking about? What are the Counting boring years? Yeah. He lived this long. He lived that long. He died. Genealogies. Genealogies. Also numbers where it's listing out all of the offerings. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or all the different people that came here or went there and how many were in each tribe and... You know, to to an archaeologist, an anthropologist, or a historical sociologist, those are called treasure troves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's exactly the kind of data we wish we had for every ancient nation, and we don't. The Bible supplies it a plenty for Israel. And you said genealogies. I said chronology. They're not exactly the same thing because the genealogy can be incomplete <laughs> and provide a, a chronology with, with some gaps and, and missing steps in it. On the other hand, a complete genealogy with all years accounted for and all um, people descended from whomever are recorded, the two the two become identical. You can look at a genealogy and say, oh, I can add up how many years this person lived before he had a son, and then how long that son lived before he had a son, and how long he lived, and you can come up with a number. This is called arithmetic, <laughs> um, and we... Since, well, here's the thing. Since Genesis 1, we believe that God can count. Oh, wait. We're not sure about Genesis 1 either. Can God count days? Does God know what a day is? And can he count them accurately? Apparently not, according to a lot of evangelicals. Forget the liberals. They are already convinced God can't count. Um, and so when we get to the, the genealogies, it's no big deal to say, well, God wasn't trying very hard. Yes, he could count. He can do anything. <laughs> but he obviously didn't here because as we consult with our archaeologists and our uh, ancient historians, they come up with very different numbers and they're the experts. So obviously, they have, I mean, they have degrees from Harvard and Oxford and all kinds of places. They obviously know what they're talking about. We, we couldn't. It would be rude to challenge them or ask, are you idiots or something? And um, so we'll just go with that. And so whatever God's getting at, you know, what's, what matters are the spiritual truths. What matters is the gospel message. What matters is that God is a mighty God who rescues his people and values liberty and freedom. If you get that out of it, when it happened and how it happened and whether it was really such a big deal, that, that's not really what the Bible's about. And as you say, one of the major themes of this podcast and its predecessor has been the biblical unity of truth and history. God reveals himself in history, because if he didn't, it wouldn't be revelation. <laughs> it would be some kind of hidden esoteric something that nobody knows about, because we live in history. We act in history. We move in history. And Jesus came down into our history. If we're going to blow away history, we end up with the kind of thing Paul was tackling in 1 Corinthians 15, where some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead. What's with that? If, if Jesus didn't rise in time and space, in fact, if he did not rise on the third day, then Christianity is a lie. He's, he's willing to tie the truth of the gospel to the calendar, to a specific time a specific geographical location under the rule of a particular Roman procurator and say, this is when it happened. This is how it happened. And if we're wrong or if we're lying or if we've made this up or God can't tell time, there's no gospel. Uh, and there are an awful lot of people who still don't get that. So we are challenged as, as we, as so many people are in Genesis one and two and three and 10 and 11 with the question of, is the Bible historically accurate? And if it is, then what kind of rethinking of history and chronology do we have to do? And, and that brings us to this. What, what is the importance of chronology, which is to say ordered proper sequence in a story? You want to tell me the story of your life. What kind of things probably would you want to make sure you don't screw up? Either of you ladies. <laughs> what, what things kind of have to be in the right order or we'll get very wrong ideas? Well, you should probably start with birth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that Into would be the world. Good. But you, anytime you want to tell about something that's significant in your life, you're going to want to tell what led up to it mm -hmm. because things don't just come out of nowhere. Um, 
if I was telling about how I ended up in Africa, I would have to go back to before I was born when my mm -hmm. parents went to Africa, which tells why they wanted to go again. Yes. Um, but also the process of trying to get out there and what we had to do along the way, because all of those build into each other and create a full picture. But I'm not going to start at the end now and then tell you about you know, grad school and then suddenly tell you about getting married and then tell you about when I was five and somehow explain how I got to Africa. Um, yeah. And I wouldn't probably, I would probably want to precede the fact of my having a child with the fact of my marriage. And you'd probably like want to make sure that the marriage <laughs> came first. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that the, the, the jobs that I got that were contingent on my graduating college um, were preceded by my graduating college, things like that. <laughs> Yeah. It's making me think I often grade uh, literature take-home tests mm -hmm. and students often answer questions in non-chronological order from the book. Mm -hmm. And so they're having a character already finish the story and then they're jumping back to tell me a different event and it just creates so much confusion because if they'd put it in order, it actually would have helped mm -hmm. their argument a lot more. <laughs> and as I pointed out many times now, an awful lot of Christians learned the Bible exactly that way in Sunday school. Mm -hmm. So you, you go one Sunday and David's killing Goliath, and you go another Sunday and Jonah's trapped in a whale, and you go another Sunday and Jesus is raising Lazarus, and you go another Sunday and Paul's going over a, a wall in a basket. And then the next Sunday, God's creating heaven and earth. And, and, and then there's a Sunday where, but God loved the world. Let me tell you about the love of God. How does any child make sense out of that? Where's where where's the meaning is in the story, which is to say, in a sequence of events. Otherwise, you have just little cute anecdotes that lose their their integrity and their meaning. So you you, you hear David and Goliath, and you decide, well, the meaning of that is the bigger they are, the higher, harder they fall. <laughs> Um, and it gets reduced to little moralisms along the lines of Aesop's fables mm -hmm. because it doesn't tie into anything. It doesn't come out of anything or go anywhere. doesn't and, point to anything. Yeah, it doesn't point to anything. And so the, the gospel stories are lost. And what happens in Sunday school, and unfortunately often from the pulpit as well, is that we don't know what in the world these people, we, we recognize names and events. I mean, Daniel the Lion's Den, okay, we know that one. And we may, Esther and that golden scepter that's being raised to her, we, we, we may know about that. But when was that with relation to Elijah going up into heaven in a whirlwind? And where was that compared with um, Peter being thrown into prison or John the Baptist beheaded? And, and meaning slips away because story is gone, and story's gone because there's no sequence, because the chronology's not there. Mm -hmm. We just have random events, unconnected, disconnected, put in false connections. And, and, and we're supposed to make something of this? Uh, no wonder children don't like history. <laughs> why, why should they? And why, no wonder that so many Christian young people don't understand the Bible. They, they may or may not recognize characters and events, but ask them to put it together in a continuous story, um, most of them can't. And I would challenge right now anybody who's listening, turn to the person next to you, pause this, turn to the person next to you and say, let me tell you the story of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens. And then go until Jesus ascends into heaven at the very least. Tell a story. Try to do it in under 10 minutes. And if you can't, and you've been a Christian for more than a few years, you probably should ask yourself why that is. Maybe you can blame somebody else, and that may be valid, but maybe you need to challenge yourself and ask, why haven't I insisted on understanding what this Bible thing is while these pages are here, while these books are here, and, and what in the world this book is about? Is it just a collection of... I When I was a child, I, was, I must have been about kindergarten. I remember thinking to myself, I wonder which books of the Bible have the Bible stories and which have the memory verses. <laughs> and I, I, I don't know how old I was before I figured that one out. Um, 
because, you know, generally the memory verses don't come from the historical section so much, unless it's Jesus' sermons. Yes. Um, well, one of the things that I'm, I've been thinking as you've been talking, Greg, is a lot of our issues since the mid-1800s is we've kind of surrendered everything to experts. Oh, yes. And so in, in Egypt, in Egyptology, the experts know, we don't know, so we just leave it to them. But we do that to the Bible as well. Mm -hmm. where we we only grab the surface and we expect other people to figure out the rest for us. I mean, how many, I don't want to necessarily know the answer, but how many <laughs> Christians have never read through the whole Bible? I know I was speaking to a longtime Christian lady who's, I think she's in her 70s, and she didn't know the story of Jonah and had never read the Bible. And she'd been a Christian for at least 40 years. She'd never read the whole thing straight through or even mm. the whole thing in general. Yeah, It's... We've kind of gotten this sense that, you know, we just learn little bits and there's other people who learn all of it and tell us what we need to know. Mm -hmm. um, Academic consensus is not a good <laughs> proxy for truth. <laughs> yeah. It's just not. If you've spent any time in academia, you know this. <laughs> Your own well, experience can testify. <laughs> well, you, you must realize, ladies, that we think of ourselves more or less as scholars, let's face it. We, we teach and talk about some rather abstract things at times and some, some topics that ordinary, ordinary people don't <laughs> give a lot of time to because, you know, they have to make a living and take care of their kids and things. And there is, there is a sense in which we're supposed to, if, if we're gifted this way and called this way, we're supposed to help people understand. Mm. Um, one of the, the problems is that we wait so long to do it and we, we generally, generically, those who are called to teach, um, whether it be the Bible or, or education in general, sometimes we, we we don't start or we're not allowed to start or parents don't want it started until the kids are in high school, juniors and seniors, or junior college, or juniors in college. And I think part of that is waiting for the inner light to testify to your being an expert. Right? You know, and that it turns out that that feeling doesn't come even when you have achieved no. relative expertise. <laughs> it, <laughs> it, this it, is it, true. It doesn't, no. You just, uh, the, the first hint probably is people start asking you questions and you actually know the answers. <laughs> uh, people have asked me, well, what was your major in? And when I tell them physics, they're generally shocked. <laughs> um, so which seminary did you go to? I didn't. And for some people, for me, that, that, that's that been a stumbling block. Okay. Well, if you haven't been in seminary, and, and, and there's, this, there's this tug of war I see going on in their thinking, well, how can he know this stuff? And then the second thing is, how can he know it? Why does he know it? And I don't. Mm -hmm. And that's a question people don't want to answer. Uh, it's it would be easy to conclude. Well, people like the three of us. We're we're scholars, and we have a lot of time to study. And maybe we're super geniuses. You know what? Um, no, <laughs> nope. <laughs> In fact, for me, currently, neither of those are true. <laughs> They're not a super genius, and also no time to study. <laughs> no. Uh, God bless me with a very good memory, but beyond that, okay, I can go analytical when I need to, and I can go. What's what's the other? Um, analytic and synthetic, uh, big picture and little picture. God has given me that. I can switch back and forth. But uh, in school, there were always kids who knew more than I did. There were always kids who got better grades than I did. I wasn't that special. I really wasn't special at all. And sometimes I got really stinky grades compared to some of the kids out of public schools. Uh, learning is something God calls us to, and you either take it seriously and you want to do it because you learn more about God's world and therefore more about God, or you don't care, or you haven't made that connection yet. You haven't seen that if you want to know your Lord and Savior, you need to know more about his world so you know what kind of God you're dealing with. And if you want to know the Bible, you need to know, first of all, you have to read, have read the Bible, and you need to find out what chronological order lies underneath it. But then you actually do need to read some history and figure out what other things were spinning around it. What does the Bible assume that we know? Because strangely, God assumes at many points that we're not stupid, and I've never figured that one out. Um, <laughs> and as we look beyond the book of Acts and see the church moving out into the world, we, we should want to know, well, what happened next? 
Jesus has ascended to the throne of heaven, the church is on the march. Don't I want to know how we got from there to here? I don't know if we've done this yet, but I'm I'm, I'm going to remind you. I think you've both. I know Rachel's heard me do this. Uh, I'll introduce a world history class. I'll pick out one student. Say, um, you open your eyes. You're laying down in wet grass. The sky above you is gray. Uh, the air is cold. And as your ears come on, you hear in the distance some kind of clanging and stomping and yelling. It's rather faint, but uh, it does not sound good. And uh, as you register your body, you don't seem to be in your nice jeans and, and tennis shoes. It's like you're wearing something kind of flowy and girlish. <laughs> and uh, there's some tight belt you got on. You don't know about that. Um, so what do you do? And the first response without thinking is, I stand up and look around. <sighs> You've got to be kidding. Uh, <laughs> Are you sure about that? What, 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 why, why? No, I don't. I don't do that. I don't do that. Why am I not doing that? I should, should peek first. Okay, I, 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 I peek <laughs> to the left. There's um, a large man lying over there. He's not moving. He seems to be in some kind of armor, uh, an armor that not like our soldiers wear today, an armor that's very old. Um, and, and, and you see blood pooling beneath him. And you look the other way and you see another man, very much the same. These, these guys are big. They look tough. They're in armor. They, you, you see a sword thrown to one side with blood all over it. And now that you're listening a little better, what you think that maybe what you're hearing is a battle. Not with guns, but with horses, swords on shields. What do you do? Now, the point is, and I continue like that, and sooner or later, they hopefully find, start making good choices. <laughs> uh, but at the end of it all, I say, now, what would you, what would you, you, you know, there's a battle going on down there. And you know, these people beside you have been killed and you haven't. And you find that you're carrying something around your waist in a packet. It looks like some kind of official writing, but unfortunately, you can't read it because you don't know the language. What would what would be really cool right now if I knew who these people were, what battle this is? Why? <laughs> because then I know whose side I'm on? Oh, yes. Wouldn't that be really nice right now to know whose side <laughs> you're on, to know what that battle is, and to know what happens to you if one side wins and the other loses? Ooh. <laughs> yeah, too bad you can't read Latin. Um <laughs> <laughs> and and they they kind of get it at that point. Oh, so history is a story, and we're in the story. Might it help if we knew our part of the story? But that would involve knowing how this huge spiritual battle began. Who's winning? Who's on the battle line? Who are our allies? Who are our enemies? Who can I trust? And who can I not trust? And that pretty girl who calls to me from the tree line and says, uh, nomine est uh, mea Morgana. Um, am I so, Morgana, I think don't that's her name. Don't trust her. <laughs> should, should, should I go with and her? And don't She's... tell her your name. <laughs> uh, now, we've, we, we've all heard people who can't explain stories try to tell us the plot of a book or a movie. <laughs> and it's horrible. And we go, what? Who, who did what to whom? Oh, well, that was before this happened. Uh, to whom? To the girl. Which girl? The other one. What other? <laughs> As we come to study history, we have to recognize that this is God's story in the truest sense of the word. Not, not simply in the sense that he guides the broad parameters, but that he has ordained every bit, every part, every detail to the last syllable of recorded time. And that if we are to understand this story, we need his official commentary, as it's revealed in Scripture, and we need to know the broad principles of who he is, as revealed in Scripture, so we know what kind of God he is, how he acts, what his ways with men are like, uh, and, and then we need to know what's already happened and where we are in the story. Jesus went back to heaven 2,000 years ago. That's meaningful. That's significant unless you're writing a history that doesn't include Jesus. And unfortunately, 
not only secular texts have a habit of ignoring Jesus, so do Christian texts. Uh, they will mention that, yeah, Jesus was born, and he was the Son of God, and his followers said he rose from the dead, and people went out and preached in his name. Next chapter, then there was Rome, and Rome fell, and then there were the Middle Ages, and uh, Wait, they were why horrible. did Rome fall? <laughs> <laughs> it just, yeah, it did. And in like... Not, and not only does Jesus get left out, a lot of, of textbooks do things like, oh, let's, yeah, there was, there was this thing called Constantinople, but that's Far East. We won't worry about that. What really <laughs> matters, um, a thousand-year Christian kingdom, and you don't know anything about it? That's a little, mm. <laughs> So we're, we're laying foundation here. We're, yeah. we're, we're looking at the beginning of the story as far as secular history goes. They, they don't have much. The Egyptians did not keep good records. No pagan nation kept good records. First of all, they didn't really grasp the idea of linear time. They had no concept of successive story. They sometimes tracked dynasties, but not always accurately because whoever was in control always wanted to make believe that his was the longest and the best, and he would include his time on the throne with his father and his time on the throne with his son, so his, la his reign would get particularly long. <laughs> because that's just cool. And the rain, and the reigns of his ancestors, well, they must have lived for thousands of years, maybe remembering back to biblical histories. Uh, and, and so when we when we simply come to to pagan chronologies, such as they are, and there's not much, um we we find messes. We find people who don't respect history, don't record it accurately. And as we find as archaeologists turn up documents, as I've said a number of times, mostly um slave trade deals, wheat sales, and a lot of magical spells, both in Egypt and Assyria particularly. Uh, what we would love is a history of Assyria from the beginning, written by successive eyewitnesses with a chronological table beside it detailing <laughs> the lives and deaths of all of the emperors and their territorial gains. Wouldn't that be great? Funny, that's what we have in the Bible. <laughs> yeah, we have that in the Bible. And ever since Christianity has gone worldwide, almost every nation on earth has adopted the same procedure, but the ancient world plane just didn't. Mm -hmm. um, as far as Egyptian chronology is concerned, it is based on a sequencing of dynasties, but that series of dynasties... Uh, was not recorded. Let me find the. Let me see if I can find the date here. By a gentleman, gentleman, a, a priest historian named Manetho, uh, and he lived 300 BC. By 300 BC, not an BC, eyewitness. Not too much. <laughs> no, you can't really eyewitness the entire history for one thing. Yeah, and by 300 BC, uh, Egypt is no longer Egyptian. It's a Greek. Satellite kingdom, mm -hmm. ruled by the, T T the Ptolemaic dynasty. The, the pyramids have been standing for 1,500 years or more. And, but, and what we have from Manetho is a list of names in order. Several, several different lists of, of different names that seem to be in some kind of order. I said we have them from Manetho. That's actually a misstatement. We don't have them from Manetho. Whatever he wrote didn't survive. What we have are later historians who copied him and put his writings into their books, which, you know, is good and all because that, that's legitimate. You can, you can repeat mm -hmm. ancient records, except when we compare the copies, they don't agree. Mm -hmm. So the one document, the one person who seems like maybe he was trying to, to figure out Egyptian chronology came a thousand years too late. Um, we don't have what he wrote, and people who did try to copy him got it wrong, and we're not sure what all those names mean, or how they're to be arranged, or if they if were these all pharaohs? Did they reign in succession? Was there any overlap of father and son, as is often the way? Were any of these dynasties reigning at the same time? Because we do know there was an Upper Egypt and a Lower Egypt, and they were not always united. Mm -hmm. uh, Mene supposedly united in the beginning of the first kingdom, but after that, there's historical evidence that the kingdom was split a number of times. The Even the standard chronologies tell us that on a couple of occasions, Egypt descended into chaos for X number of years, and we're not really clear what happened there. Uh, so that's that's the backbone 
for our understanding of Egyptian chronology. And if that were not bad enough, uh, of the ancient kingdoms, Egypt was the first that historians and archaeologists really latched onto, hmm. because so much of it was still standing above the sands of Egypt. And once Chapoleon was able to translate the Rosetta Stone and, and figure out hieroglyphics, you could simply go out a day's walk from Cairo and look around and read ancient records that mostly were about the gods and magic spells and such. But, you know, occasionally <laughs> you get names of kings and things. Um, and, and so Egypt had a special prestige for a while. And since it was a good starting point, the timelines of every other nation in the ancient world that existed in and about the Mediterranean got pegged into Egypt's timeline. So if we're wrong about Egypt, we're wrong about everybody. And we have a problem. And then when we look at the Bible and say, hey, it's funny, the Bible doesn't agree with us. Funny is not exactly the word you want to use here. Uh, it sounds like God kept his own records and he does not appreciate yours. <laughs> God says your records and your reconstruction of the timeline is incorrect. And he actually has the courtesy to show us, here's when these things happened. Solomon's temple, back up 480 years. You're at the Exodus. Um, back up from there, 430 years, and Abraham's entering the promised land. Ten generations before that, we have a worldwide flood. Ten generations before that, God created heavens and earth. No other w nation, culture, society gives us anything remotely like that, but the world looks at that and scoffs, and unfortunately, evangelicals do too, and say, but that's so you know superstitious and silly and... I mean, a world that's only 6,000 years old, and you think this book has all kinds of information about it. No, the Bible is there to talk about deep spiritual realities, which played out in a historical context of this planet we call Earth, in particular geographical settings, which strangely enough, in God's providence, centered in and about the Mediterranean Sea and the, Gulf, and the Persian Gulf, and this land called Mesopotamia, and Judea, and yes, Egypt, and then finally, a little bit of Greece and a little bit of Rome before the Bible stops and opens the gospel up to the world. So we, we've kind of danced around, but these are some of the things that any serious consideration of teaching history has got to get under its belt. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to teach history, one of the first things you've got to do is start a timeline. Maybe you don't put it all up up front. Maybe you build it a little bit as you go. I know one of my first encounters with Earth's history was sitting in Pastor Powell's class. I think I was in seventh grade. And he, without a textbook, just started diagramming timelines of medieval and modern Europe. One country at a time, Egypt, or not Egypt, I'm sorry, Germany, and then England and France. And that's how I learned to understand history. And interestingly enough, at one point, we were, I think we were doing Germany, and we hit something, you know, the 1200s or something. I said, oh, and the next thing is the Magna Carta. And the other students turned to me and said, what are you talking about? That's England. But it <laughs> comes next on the timeline. <laughs> These things are happening simultaneously. <laughs> <laughs> I got that. I didn't know why anyone else would be surprised at it. I was kind of, kind of poo-pooed by the other students. Like, well, that's not what we're not talking about that country. Well, I get that. But, you know, it, it was important. And there, there, there is overlapping of, of what's going on. And these countries do influence one another. And when we're studying um, the history of Israel, knowing what's going on in Egypt is helpful. Put it the other way, if we want to study Egypt, knowing what goes on, what's going on in Israel is essential. Mm -hmm. Because that's where the promise is. That's the covenant. That's the word of God and the worship of God. That's the promised seed. That's the heart of what God's doing. And so we need to be able to fit these things in. Let me give you one really simple example. Um, anybody who's studied much Egyptian history will run into the heretic king Akhenaten, Amenhotep IV. Um, he supposedly is the first monotheist. Uh, they've even done movies about him. The first <laughs> one who believed in a single God before Moses, before Israel, before the Bible. Assuming Moses wrote the Bible. Um, there was this man who shines like a, a shining star in the darkness, believing in one God and a high moral code. Sounds really impressive. It makes, like, it makes the Bible sound like kind of a 
Johnny come lately of, oh yeah, Israel finally figured that out. <laughs> Maybe they figured it out while they were in uh, slavery. But once we start reorganizing Egypt's chronology in biblical terms, it turns out that um, Akhenaten didn't live way back before Moses. He lived about the time of Isaiah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what, what is the solution for Egyptian chronology? Well, I will, for those of you who care and who want to do some reading, uh, I'm going to recommend, uh, on, uh, not as official recommendations at the end of things, <laughs> but right up front, uh, a couple of books. Um, Back in uh, 1971, an Adventist scholar named Donovan Curraville wrote a book called The Exodus Problems and Its uh, Ramifications. And don't let the fact he's a Seventh-day Adventist scare you away. He doesn't get very near any kind of serious theology beyond saying the Bible is accurate and inerrant. And he, but he's not a great writer, and it's hard sometimes to follow what he's saying. And to, to figure it out. But what he basically is getting at is, even secular scholars admit that you can't simply lay Manitho's dynasties one after another and, and have the history of Egypt. It doesn't work. We already know there are problems with that. And so even secular scholars have already begun to shorten Egypt's history by what Kerrville's success we do more of recognizing that sometimes dynasties overlapped, that sometimes there was a dynasty ruling in the north, another ruling in the south, and such things. Um, he, Kerrville just suggests that we do more of it, and he begins to suggest ways that this could happen. So if you want to go back to, as it were, an original source of a man who was thinking through these things on his own, Donovan Kerrville, The Exodus Problem. I don't know how easy that book is to find anymore. One book you can find, however, is by John Ashton and David Down. It's called Unwrapping the Pharaohs. How Egyptian Archaeology Confirms the Biblical Timeline. It's uh, published by Master Books, which it does a lot of publishing for um, Ken Ham and um, Answers in Genesis and all of that group. Uh, this is written about the level of high school or junior high, so it's not going to be beyond anybody's ability to understand. And it starts where Curraville left off and acknowledges that they're following his lead and tries to bring things down to a very simple level so you can get it. And it has, it, it, it's, it's a coffee table book. It has pictures and charts and maps, and it's a nice presentation. So if you want a starting point to kind of get a grip on what's going on here, this, this is a good book. And your children, if they are interested in Egypt at all, and who isn't interested in pyramids, <laughs> this, is, this is something that, that they would profit from. Also, in um, Answers in Genesis, is um, multi-level series, the title of which is, oh, rats. The New Answers book. Oh, you did reference this. I see it in the footnote. Oh, okay. Elizabeth Mitchell? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Why? Okay, you're looking at, not the one I'm looking at. It's good. Oh, okay. Elizabeth Mitchell, <laughs> yeah. Does it say which volume it is? Volume, uh, uh, book two. two. Okay, yeah. book two. Book two. Okay, cool. So, that's something else, and the whole series is certainly worth having. You can get it in paperback. I don't know what it costs, but it wouldn't hurt you to have it. And again, another, I, I believe she's an Adventist scholar. I'm not positive about that. But she's writing in the same tradition, and she, she's answering the question, does an Egyptian chronology disprove the biblical timeline? And so she goes back and deals with a lot of what we've been talking about. Here's what we actually know. And, and once we begin to put things in place, some things start becoming interesting. Uh, we, we ask, is there any record, any place of the Exodus? Well, once we rearrange things a bit, here's something that just might be. This is from, um, it's called the Apoorah Papyrus. Uh, this is from one particular translation. It runs like this. Plague is throughout the land. Blood is everywhere. Forsooth, the river is blood, yet men drink of it. Forsooth, gates, columns, and walls are consumed by fire. Forsooth, men are few. He who places his brother in the ground is everywhere. Forsooth, the desert is throughout the land. The gnomes are laid waste. A foreign tribe from abroad has come to Egypt. Forsooth, gold and lapis lazuli, silvery, silver and malachite, carnelian and bronze, stones of Yabet and there's a gap, are fastened on the necks 
of female slaves. Female slaves wearing the treasures of Egypt. Ha! Huh. Egypt <laughs> open to invasion by a foreign tribe. The river is blood. Ha! Huh. The uh, the invasion is pretty well um, documented and acknowledged. The Hyksos, right? Mm -hmm. But what's so interesting, again, the video that I saw, they actually interviewed the man who is the overseer of the museum that currently holds that papyrus mm. in um, the Netherlands. And the this Christian man was saying, well, it says this in the, you know, the Exodus account says this and this. And every single time he kept saying, no, no, it's not from the right time period. And I'm pretty sure the author was just speaking in myth and legend. <laughs> and he was made because it's too fantastical to have possibly happened. Therefore, it doesn't matter that it matches the Bible. I'm sure it's not a confirmation as the guy's going, but it's the same. No, no, it's not. It was it's pretty amazing to watch how your presupposition will still determine how well you can actually see obvious truth in something like that. Well, in terms of Egypt's political history, by the time Abraham reached Egypt, it was a prosperous nation. Josephus says that Abraham taught mathematics and astronomy to the Egyptians. We hmm. don't know if that's true, but if it is, it's fascinating particularly since the pyramids have that fine uh, astronomical, mathematical edge to them. <laughs> um, so someplace about there, we have the pyramids. And, and, and as we go through the Bible, we're in Egypt repeatedly. Mm -hmm. and no, but no one ever says, hey, look over there, pyramids. They were there. Um, there's a lot that the Bible doesn't mention because... Why? Everyone knows the, the, the pyramids are there. Why, why bother? Are they relevant to the immediate discussion? The mm -hmm. Tower of Babel was. After mm -hmm. that, we really don't hear about ziggurats, and yet every pagan city had one. But having discussed the archetype, the biblical writers feel no great need to go back and talk about all of the copies, including mm -hmm. the pyramids. We, we track the family of Abraham as they go down into Egypt in the days of Jacob and Joseph, we see them grow and multiply. We see them come out of Egypt in the Exodus. We see Egypt destroyed by God's plagues and invaded by a foreign power. And it pretty much goes uh, radio silent for the next few hundred years. Because this guy, you know how hard it is to rebuild a nation when your leadership is gone, your cattle are gone, your treasures are gone? Um, and you no longer believe in your gods because they just got smashed down by this <laughs> God of Israel. More than not, probably the most likely thing that's going to happen is you're not going to talk about it a whole lot. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there would be a certain reluctance to write down in your hieroglyphics and our gods who were smashed by the, this great God of Israel. But would you even have time? Uh, there's no food. You don't have time to go around carving things in hieroglyphics. you got to find some food someplace. So maybe you'll leave Egypt. Maybe you go upstream looking for something. Maybe you learn how to fish in the in the delta. Something's got to be cut. And then this this foreign power comes in, and they're going to take over, and they're going to tax, and they're going to loot and pillage and destroy. It was miserable to be an Egyptian for a long time, and we really don't hear much about uh, about Egypt as a historical power until the time of Solomon, and then suddenly Egypt is back on its feet again. And we have uh, a king who's a king in Egypt who's powerful enough to come up and take frontier towns, give his daughter to Solomon, give them a town he's captured as a gift. And and after Solomon's death, we have another king who's Egyptian king who's able to actually invade Judea, conquer Judea, mm -hmm. and to and loot the temple and take its treasures. Uh, Kerville's reconstruction makes this uh, Thutmose the third, who was. Uh, the great conqueror of that era. And so there, that would make sense there. And e Egypt continues to be a major player all the way up to the coming of Assyria, actually through Assyria. Assyria conquers Egypt, and there's there's a, a you, each using the other to a certain extent, but, but Assyria being in charge. Then comes Babylon, and from there on, Egypt fades. And it's conquered by Alexander, and it's never a major power again. We run into it in the New Testament when Jesus uh, is carried away in his infancy for his protection to Egypt. 
we we run into the Ethiopian eunuch. We know that the early church got a, a foothold in Egypt, and and then Egypt, um, except as a center of learning, Alexandria does isn't that impressive? It's not the political center of the world, uh, and we'll we'll talk about all these things as we as we come to them. But it is kind of a historical constant. It's always there in the background, rising and falling, and it enters the biblical story many many times. God uses it as a foil to judge his people, to move people and events around so they can be where he needs them to be. And as you read the Bible, and, and take it historic, with historical seriousness, this all makes sense. And Egypt becomes kind of, oh yeah, here come the Egyptians again. Saw that coming. And, and we have some sense of them because we do have um, Relics and artifacts and myths and legends and some stories eventually, some histories eventually. So there you go. This is <laughs> the beginning of our march forward into history. Egypt's a thing. It's just not the most important thing. God's covenant with his people is the most important thing. That's the center of history. And uh, there are a lot of historians, not only secular historians, but even evangelical historians who have a real trouble with that because it sounds like we're playing favorites. We're emphasizing one people above another. Isn't that, you know, ethnocentric or something? Isn't that bad? No. <laughs> it's not ethnocentric. It's covenant centric. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, we are so out of time for today. Um, so let's do some quick recommendations. Rachel, you mentioned you had one ready to go. Yes. So my husband introduced me and my parents this last week to the first video in a series that's called Patterns of Evidence uh, made by filmmaker Timothy Mahoney. And the first one we watched is on the evidence for the Exodus uh, that, of course, begins with all the experts saying there's no evidence. But then he starts looking in different time periods uh, besides what they think and suddenly finds the perfect succession mm -hmm. of all the archaeological evidence um, up through the conquest of the land. Uh, and he talks a little bit about the shifting chronologies, but does a lot to document what actually is there in the ground that shows exactly what the Bible says. Um, the only issue is it's in the quote unquote wrong time. So... <laughs> That's why Egyptologists won't accept that it happened. Um, we want he evidence, has, but not that evidence. That doesn't yeah, count. <laughs> where they all say no, because it has to be, they all think it, Ramses II is the Pharaoh because his name is one of the cities named in the beginning of the book of Exodus. So he has to be the Pharaoh. Um, and no, nothing's there, funny enough, but just the amount of things they find of like, oh, suddenly Semitic people showed up. They're shepherds. Suddenly they exploded in population. Suddenly they all disappeared. Suddenly for a generation, <laughs> there were 60% women and only 40% men and tons of infant graves of boys. Um, just so many, so we many things. Figure this out. <laughs> yeah. And so it's, but none of them want to talk about those things. So mm. the people they're looking for are people who actually want to find things according to what the Bible says. Um, but yeah, there's just, it's a fascinating. Um, what is the name of the video again? Uh, it's Patterns of Evidence is the series, and then it's Patterns of Evidence Exodus is the particular mm -hmm. one. Cool. Um, so, and how long is the video? It's about two hours, okay. so it's it's pretty significant. And then they did some on uh, the journey to Mount Sinai and where Mount Sinai is. I think something on the Red Sea crossing, and so they're basically trying to they they believe the Bible is history, so they think there should be evidence there, and they're they're looking for it. Cool. Well, my recommendation is, sorry, did you want to? I was just going to say that one of the deans of, of history, of Egyptian history in the 1800s, is a man named George Rawlinson. This is his comment in 1886. It's a patent fact that the chron chronological element in early Egyptian history is in a state of almost hopeless obscurity. <laughs> There's one of the fathers of Egyptology <laughs> saying, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, the people who run the museums and the universities today, they're not going to admit that. Well, and that's one of their big points is if we actually change the chronology, every single Egyptology book would be wrong. And they'd have to rewrite <laughs> all of them. And nobody wants to do that. <laughs> no, that would be like work or something. Yeah. Okay. So what's Admitting your we were wrong? <laughs> what's your recommendation, Emily? 
Uh, my recommendation is only tangentially related. Um, it is related in that two of my friends are independently writing archaeological thrillers, um, and they have permitted me to glance at some of their early parts of their writing, which has been a delight. Um, so my recommendation is sharing what you've written with people, <laughs> even if you don't think it's very good. Um, nice. Because and here is the key argument. If you do not share what you write with people, everything you make exists at their expense because it's locked away. You've spent time on it and they don't get to enjoy it. <laughs> and that, mm. that makes me feel sad. So it makes me share what I write with people, even if it's not very good. <laughs> um, I well. I'm trying to think of something that I haven't recommended before, and <laughs> I'm not sure I can. <laughs> uh, I'm going to recommend reading English mysteries from the early 20th century, British mysteries, I guess I should say. I've been dividing my time between older English British mysteries and some modern American stuff. And there is no comparison. Um, <laughs> nope. First, these and most of the older British writers actually were female. Mm -hmm. You can think Agatha Christie, Josephine Tay, Dorothy Sayers, Michael Marsh. There are others. Uh, second, they they knew grammar. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike modern writers, I am so tired of dangling participles <laughs> and participles that are just randomly attached to anything at all, hoping that you can make the logical jump and figure out what in the world's going on here. I'm also tired of writers who write in the present tense. <laughs> um, Amen to that. <laughs> oh no, I just wrote a short story that's in the present tense. Oh no, maybe I won't share it with you guys. <laughs> I am also, I, I, I am tired, you know, we're, we're all tired of, of modern stories that have the obligatory sex scenes and all of that. Mm -hmm. But in reading some of these modern writers, uh, they're not, the ones I've been writing aren't bad. That is, they're not particularly graphic and they generally get through the sex scene real fast. They just think it's an important develop, step in the development of the character. You go back and you read Agatha Christie or Dorothy Sayers and I go Marsh and they're not there. It's not because they lived in a purer society. <laughs> they acknowledge the fact that adultery happened, that there was prostitution, that this man is not quite nice, that this these two females living together, the if you read between the lines, you say, oh, they're homosexuals, they're lesbians. Um, but they don't feel a need to to push your face into it. Uh, on just about every level, they are better writers. And as you read through them, they are quoting the Bible, the prayer book, Shakespeare, and the whole host of Western literature with the assumption you know what in the world they're making allusion to. It's like sitting down and talking to educated people. As opposed to one authoress I'm, I'm reading right now, uh, her allusions are to McDonald's and Sears and AT&T uh, and Big Macs. Like, I've encountered okay, those things in my life. I don't need to read about yeah, them. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that I know very well the world you're describing. Her time period's the 1980s, and she and she even mentioned the town, I, well, the city I came from, Reading. One of her characters goes there, like, "Oh, Reading, yeah, okay, well, that was thrilling." I've been to London too. You could talk about London. <laughs> um, the there is something to be said about the older sort of mystery, and not always, but sometimes, the trail of evidence is more logical and doesn't depend so much upon coincidence or you accidentally discover something. Some of these authors, I've, I've found the pattern is that you're, you're working through and you're looking for evidence, you're looking for clues. They don't have any. They don't know what's going on. And so you're waiting together and then suddenly, two thirds of the way through, something happens and, oh, now we have a lead. And you say, oh, I now I have a lead too. <laughs> um, and you're you're trying to follow as fast as they are and they're, they're lost and things kind of can... There's no... It's not a it's not a book that's a mystery. Mm -hmm. It's a book that sets up as mystery, which it solves 
two thirds of the way, th- or start solving two thirds of the way through. As you watch a passive observer. Yeah, as you sit here, and mm-hmm. I, hopefully you're interested in the characters because there's not much going on with the mystery. Mm-hmm. Uh, so anyway, if you've never read one of the older British authors writing detective stories, you should try it out. Mm-hmm. And um, you might learn some things about the English language and how to plot a story and character development that you're not going to get by reading anything that's been written in the last 50 years. I love what you do with your students in is it expository writing where you have them uh-huh. read a, a mystery. And yep. partway through, you have them all write essays on who they think did it and why. And yeah, it's I, a good time. Uh, I, they all pick this. Ideally, they all pick the same book. Some of them have already read it. And that complicates things. But the book in question is The Moving Finger by Agatha Christie. Oh, is it always the same book? It's always the same book, yeah. Oh. Huh. Um, because it's a book that most people haven't read. I can't mm-hmm. pick one of the, the big ones because most people right. have read them or seen the movies or something. Mm-hmm. But this is obscure enough, but it's very well written, tightly written. And you're not seeing it through the eyes of Miss Marple or Hector Pearl. Miss Marple shows up very near the end and you don't. she doesn't really give anything away. So you're just looking over the shoulder of the narrator, who seems to be an okay guy. Um, he's a down pilot who's recovering in a small village. And they're, so they're allowed to read to a point where I band off the pages and say, here you stop. <laughs> you may not read the rest. Ah, but I need to know that. No, you're going to go back and figure it out now. <laughs> and you're going to record all the clues, and then you're going to make your best guess. And... This last time round, they had great ideas and they had good <laughs> evidence, and not one of them got it. Hey. So, <laughs> <laughs> but they were thinking. Good times. All right. Well, speaking of good times, thank you both for this conversation. It's been a delightful hour. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thanks to our financial supporters for keeping the show rolling. We really appreciate you. And thank you for listening. Uh, go ahead and tell a friend about us. Uh, give us a five-star review if you like us. Um, subscribe on any of your favorite podcast catchers, whatever you use. Um, and if we're not on your favorite podcast catcher, please let us know. Uh, to let us know, you can email us at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. You can also ask us anything you want there. David will read it. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll read it. Um, good night, Gracie. Say good night, Gracie. Good night, Gracie.